the domino effect has started. Everything that we were seeing happen over there with Oakland and everything is it's, it's, it's happening here. The domino effect has started. Let's check this out, man. Westfield Mall seeks to end World Trade Center lease over homelessness and crime. Right now at 530, a war of words escalating tonight at one of New York City's largest transit hubs. We're talking about the Fulton Center in lower Manhattan. There's a mall inside and the operator says crime has gotten so bad there, they are breaking the lease and closing down shops. But the MTA says not so fast. News 4's Erica Byfield breaks down both sides of the story. There is a real tug of war happening here. Now the MTA is asking a judge to step in and force Westfield to stay. The shops are supposed to be part of Fulton Center's appeal. Retail upstairs, a transit hub that services eight subway lines down below. But something's happened. Most of the shops are gone, some now filled with art. It's a beautiful place, but it could be a little more well kept, and they need to do more in assisting the homeless. Homelessness is part of the reason that Westfield, the mall operator, wants out. Its leaders say crime is also a big issue, so much so that some shop owners aren't renewing leases, others breaking them early. Yeah, I guess the homeless issue can become an issue at some point because of how like mental health is kicking in. On Wednesday, we saw homeless advocates near the turnstiles. The MTA is the landlord here. Its leaders told us they have confidence in the NYPD to deal with the crime, and they want Westfield to stay put. So the transit system is suing. The lawsuit filed. How are they going to deal with the crime when they have other things to deal with now? Like, what do you want them? To, it, it's going to be so many different things that they're. Something's going to fall by the wayside. Something's going to fall. And these these businesses are like, man, we can't continue to keep being robbed and losing money. Why are we going to continue to subject ourselves to that? So, yes, a lot of these businesses, look, pretty soon, all of these malls and different places, that they're, they're going to be a, a thing of the past. Something that you talk about with your kids. I remember when the mall was down there and... My mom and dad used to take me or my family member. We would go down there, shop, go to the movies, eat in the food court. That's going to be the type of conversation is going to be this. They're leaving. Golden Federal Court last month says that the agency will face irreparable injury if Westfield abandons the Fulton Center, saying that there are three reasons that Westfield can break its 20 year lease and crime and homelessness are not included. Oh, OK. Transit leaders accuse Westfield of advancing its own self-serving business interests, saying that hurts the MTA, retail operators, and the public. The lawsuit includes a letter from a Westfield executive which says the current situation is financially unsustainable and Westfield is no longer in a position to be able to operate its premises at Fulton Center. Someone has to do the work. Westfield also operates the mall inside the Oculus, which is another transit hub. The MTA also tells us in the wake of 9-11, Fulton Center was a centerpiece of redevelopment in Lower Manhattan. That's part of the messaging that it hopes persuade a judge to keep Westfield here. I think something needs to be done just to make everybody happy. So, The MTA tells us that this is the busiest station in Lower Manhattan, and that obviously shows why they care so much about what happens here. In Lower Manhattan, Erica Byfield, News 4. More than 7 million migrants have illegally crossed the U.S.-Mexico border since Joe Biden took office. The influx is impacting several cities across America, where thousands of migrants now remain after being bused there by the Texas government. Sky News Washington correspondent Annalise Nielsen has been speaking to those on the front line of the migrant crisis in Denver, Colorado. A surge of migrants causing chaos and CBS News has learned You've seen the stories. Millions of people have walked over the border between the US and Mexico in the last few years. Border states have started busing these people to cities across the country. But when the headlines disappear, what happens to all the people who've made it to America? What is the plan for sustaining this? since we have wide open borders right now, so. We're in Denver, Colorado. This is a sanctuary city, which means people who've come to America illegally. No local law enforcement won't cooperate with federal law enforcement to deport them. The city had a population of 710,000 people before it welcomed 40,000 undocumented migrants. Venezuela, 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 pobreza. Yeah. I hungry. Yeah. I hungry. We're gonna close. So every day people walk in and come back. 
For months, Yong Prince has hosted hundreds of migrants who showed up on the doorstep of her motel in the dark of night. Around 30 people first day, then I don't know how they get in. Everybody got here. In January, Yong was emotional speaking to CNN about the plight of migrants at her hotel. And it's almost like they've become your family. Yeah, yeah. I want to make sure they're eating. You want to make sure they're eating, taking care of. But when Sky News visits Yong less than two months on, we find her patience is wearing thin. So are you going to have to clean this up? Yeah, we do. She used to own this motel with her late husband and was prepared to sell it when the migrants started arriving. See, this is a prime example of people with good hearts being taken advantage of. When we get there, we discover it's been trashed. They take it out of air condition too, whoa. They already sent my lawyer before he quit. Young Prince tells us that her sale has fallen through, which means her retirement nest egg is now in doubt. They broke it in the door there. Even as we're with her, we find some of the rooms have been broken into. Excuse me, you can stay here, go, please. Although even in the messy chaos of her unexpected shelter, there's one family Young yeah, Prince has adopted as her own. I came to work to give my children a better future so they can study and have a future. And I thank God that I got here and met this beautiful person. <laughs> This is the makeshift shelter that's been running at the Denver Friends Church since the beginning of January this year. The congregation opened their doors to take people off the street in the bitter cold of the Colorado winter. Uh, food, dormida, food, uh, baño. Hola. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. They're allowed to house 29 people each night. I believe that Jesus would help the poor, he would help the suffering, he would help those that are down and out, the widow and the child and the man on the street. I believe that these families need to see the love of God and we get to do that. This entire operation has been run by volunteers. And you're yourself sleeping in a sleeping bag here. Yeah, we had a nice cot though. <laughs> we know these people. But look at how many people they have and they have structure and they have organizations and they have the means to to do this. Look at the lady before, the older lady before. Look at what they how she was taken advantage of. You know what I'm saying? Like if you have and you can, okay. Cuz you you have a cutoff point at some point in time to where you say, "Okay, you heard them say what about 29?" That's all they could do. This lady took them in and then they just kept coming, then they took over, they trashed their place and now ruined her retirement. They're coming. We have a few people that are new each time, but not often. It's a lot of the same regular people that have been coming since end of January. There's still a lot of confusion around what to do with these migrants longer term. The challenge is we don't know. We don't know if it's going to be the end of this month. We don't know how many might find jobs and find housing in this area. Some of these children might not have a home, but they found a seat in the classroom at Eagleton Elementary. At the end of 2023, the school had 220 students. After the Christmas break, they welcomed another 125 children of migrants. This is a class where some of the children who've recently moved to the district are catching up, but no one knows for how long. So initially challenges were like, where am I gonna find room for students in my classroom? What are the desks? Where are the pencils? What are, where's the extracurriculum books that I need? Like, where's the space? And so once, um, once that initial challenge is over, then it's the complexities of instruction. I've got, I'm basically teaching two classrooms and where do I put my energy? While Colorado seems to have handled its influx of migrants better than other states with sanctuary cities, there are concerns that if these buses continue to come, if more migrants come, that there simply won't be the resources to handle this long term. We are inviting them across our border or giving them permission to cross our border, or even if they come in the illegal way across our border. But we don't have a next step for them, truly. It's get in this bus, go to this city, and good luck and they arrive in a city like ours 
and our services are depleted. We have a limited amount, but it's, we're talking about weeks when what they need is a lifetime of care. What they need is a lifetime of opportunity. The Denver Friends Church says they may keep their shelter open until April if the cold weather lingers. But the plan is to shut by the end of the month. Which is hard because it's never easy to shut the doors. That's not something that any of us want to admit, um, but our volunteers are exhausted. Also new at 10, 29 migrants from Mexico and Guatemala were apprehended yesterday in Deming, New Mexico. That's according to El Paso Sector Chief Patrol Agent Anthony Scott Good. Border Patrol agents stopped a vehicle smuggling scheme, which Border Patrol says then led to a stash house. Well, the border's always been a problem you know, with, with San Diego. You know, one of those big problems is not just the people coming across, but it's the drugs and the, the, the sex traffic and the human smuggling that happens. And that's always been a problem, but never to these degrees that we're seeing it right now. I mean, this is exponentially more. And it's because we're not trying anymore. All my life, the federal government it was at least making an attempt to keep the border closed and to keep people from coming over, especially bad actors and, and people in the cartels and the gangs and people we knew really wanted to hurt us. Now it's the gates are wide open. Illegal immigrants, Illegal immigrants in landing on Bluebird Beach. Migrants are waiting out at the hot springs. Hundreds of migrants have been dropped off here in San Diego. San Diego sector of the border. Here, when I've gone to the actual poles in the fence where they come through and, and talking to some of the people, a lot of them are going to the East Coast and, and um, to someplace else. So a lot of them leave, but there's a lot we don't know. Currently, the Border Patrol is still just dropping off migrants several hundred a day. A lot of them end up at our airport. So unfortunately, San Diego Airport now has become the de facto migrant uh, shelter uh, where they sleep there. Uh, hopefully, they, you know, most of them get on a flight uh, to someplace else, but a lot of them don't have money uh, and aren't able to facilitate that. The mayor of New York, mayor of Chicago and Denver uh, complaining about you know Governor Abbott sending migrants to their to their communities. Well, we have the federal government doing that directly to us. They're the ones bringing and just dropping off the migrants. And I don't blame the Border Patrol agents. They're they're great people. They're trying to do their job, and unfortunately, their hands are tied. We witnessed. So it seems like everybody right now is saying this person. It, it's the pointing the finger. Everybody's pointing the finger. <laughs> Nobody wants to show to the blame it seems like right now and that's not good we're stuck here when we need to be working on trying to solve this thing not figure out who's to blame and what's the reason behind it no that they people are just able to walk across border patrol agents standing by it used to be in previous administrations uh in washington dc when people would come across the country illegally they would try to avoid border patrol now they run to the Border Patrol. They know all the right questions to ask, and statements to make, to, to ask for asylum. And what we see being dropped off here in San Diego County um, are mostly about 80% males that are being dropped off at the uh, transit center here in San Diego County. Most ages between like 18 to 35. And it's kind of frightening when you see 80% males from around the world, you know, coming from countries that are not our friends in some cases, and being dropped off here, there, there's there's a big concern by residents and, and politicians like myself is you know, like, okay, how do we keep our citizens safe here in San Diego County? We have embassies all over the world where people can go and apply for visas and, and, and for you know passage into the United States, and and but they don't do that. Why would they do that if they can pay somebody five thousand dollars and come come right across our border and come to the head of the line? If we would enforce our own laws of requiring people to go through the embassies in their countries and, and going through that process, it'd be a much more dignified way for immigrants to come to our country. Right now, what we're allowing is, is, is a very undignified, unhum, inhumane process where people have to come over a fence and, and we have people falling over fences and coming over the, a 30 foot fence and to break in a leg or two and go into our hospitals. We've got people coming through the water or under through a river. In the past couple of years, so there's very little in the way of safety net in California. And think about this as well. What if another 2020 hits? 
Another 2020 hits with this issue happening right now. What are we going to do? It's going to be catastrophic because the hospitals are already spread thin now. You let a 2020 pile up on top of that? Well, unfortunately, there's no there's no end in sight. We absolutely don't see any change. This is a new norm. You know, unfortunately, someday we're going to get a rude awakening, some, some catastrophe, something's going to happen that involves people coming across the border that mean us harm and then and then being able to pull that pull something off and and uh, then maybe we'll have that wake up call. But I'm, I'm hoping it comes sooner than like rather than later. An illegal immigrant who's been deported at least eight times and visited the Butler County Jail 11 times is now facing murder charges in Ohio. Furman Garcias Gutierrez was first arrested in 2001 for domestic violence and aggravated burglary. Since then, racked up assault, carrying a concealed weapon, public indecency, and drug possession charges. He's also a suspected member, a gang member, who has used seven different aliases and three different birth dates. Our next guest is sounding the alarm saying, the border is broken and we've got to stop this invasion. Butler County, Ohio Sheriff Richard Jones joins us now. Sheriff, thank you very much for being here. Uh, first of all, someone's dead in your county because uh, this person has been able to re-enter our country time and time again. How do you stop this? Listen, we got to stop it at the borders. Uh, Mayor Orcas uh, uh, it says the border's clean and it's safe. He's the main person. Uh, President Biden is another person. Uh, but Mayor Orcas is the main person that says everything's great and wonderful. We got to stop the borders. This guy has, has murdered somebody, killed somebody, and he's been arrested with weapons before. It's the most ludicrous thing you've ever seen. Our borders are wide open. We're in Ohio. We're not on the border of Mexico, but we've had over a thousand prisoners in our jail in the past three years that are from other countries. Hmm. We've had murders, we've had uh, sex crimes, and these are people that shouldn't be here. This guy shouldn't be here. Uh, but what I've been encouraging people to do, uh, the way we're gonna stop it is, Mayor Orcas, they need to sue him personally. He's not always gonna work for the President of the United States. Anybody that's been a victim, uh, uh, murdered, uh, a sex crime, have been injured, they should start suing Mayor Orcas. Uh, he's not always going to work for the president. Sue him personally. That'll make it stop. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, what happens? Do you do they serve out their jail time and then you deport them and then he shows up again? Is is that how the process ends up working? A, a lot of times, if it's uh, small charges, ICE will come get him. They deport him in a week and a half. He's back, uh, and th they they come back. It only takes them a week and a half to get back. This guy, uh, I'm not for certain that he's not killed others. He, he, he's had other charges with weapons. He comes right back across because the drug cartel helps him get back across to sell his fentanyl and his poison to the people in Ohio and throughout the country. And he comes right back. And he's got friends and family here, mm -hmm. his, his drug compadres, and it's destroying our country. And he's, I, I will say this, his parole officer, by the time we get done with him, isn't even born yet. That's how long he's going to be in prison. That's, that's, that's good to hear. Uh, by the way, the administration's telling us there's a vetting process at the border. If he's using a fake name or a fake birthday, um, could he get through that vetting process if he was, you know, if he was interdicted at the border? Listen, the only vetting process they do is they capture and give them a little citation and five years come back and go to court. They get rid of all their IDs before they come over. Of course. There's big piles of them. I've been to the border and they don't want anybody to know who they are. And that's all part of it. They keep them and give them a little, a little cell phone, a little money, and they bus them to where they're going. You don't see them walking or hitchhiking. They're bust or somebody picks them up, uh, uh, coyotes do, on this side of the country, pick them up, take them all throughout the United States. Train. And that's what they do. And, and when you stop these people, there's 3,300 uh, county sheriffs in the United States. We're not the only one that has this issue. I promise you, it's all over the country. And it's it's just out of control. People are dying. People are having... We have one guy that's in another state that took a 15-year-old with him uh, who was also an unaccompanied minor that was placed here by our government with another illegal. And her boyfriend was having sex with her. They put her in an apartment at 14 years old. 
uh, and then they fled. So we got her back, but he's still waiting to come back on charges of kidnapping. So it, and it, in Ohio, in, in Ohio. The state, Ohio. And it's all being facilitated by our federal government. It is it's a process our, they are our, from start to finish allowing to happen and helping to happen. And then you're having to deal with it, Sheriff, in your county. Thanks for um, throwing the book at this guy and everything you're trying to do. We appreciate having you this morning. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. You got it. God bless.